Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 307 RPG Podcast. My name is Patrick. I'm Nolan. Nolan and I are joined today. This is a very special episode because Nolan and I are joined today by uh, Sean K. Reynolds from Monty Cook Games to discuss the upcoming release of Tolis. Now, Nolan and I have been talking about Tolis quite a bit. It's something that we backed on Kickstarter, and we're super, super excited to get this setting in our hands. So real quick, I'll give you guys a real quick background about Sean. Well, I say real quick, but this is, this, boy, Sean, you got a heck of a background. I've been around a while. Awesome. Yeah. So Sean grew up in Southern California. After finishing his chemistry degree, he took a radical left turn and started working in the gaming industry. That is a hell of a left turn. Yeah. <laughs> He's been a webmaster, game designer, developer, freelance wrangler, and many other jobs that cannot be described in one or two words. He's worked on a couple of hundred books for half a dozen RPGs, including Numenera and three editions of D&D. Designed video games, taught classes on game design, written plays and musicals. Right there, he's plucking at my heartstrings. Run online game conventions, judged international talent search contests, and had bit parts in geeky movies like Gamers of Darkness Rising and attacking the darkness. He draws, paints, and sings with moderate skill and is a passion and is passionate about helping people and introducing others to the wonders of gaming. He lives with his cats in one of Seattle's many quirky neighborhoods. Sean, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me on your show. <laughs> that is a we're that excited. is a yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, we're here today to talk about Tolis. Um, this is an amazing setting. I mean, we keep seeing the artwork and everything that we that Nolan's been getting for the uh, for the Kickstarter, and it is just absolutely incredible. And we're going to get into that in just a second, but we'd like to talk a little bit about you. And, and so, uh, for the first question, I'm going to throw it over to Nolan so he can get us started. I think when we looked at that there, you know, the, the big turn uh, from where you started to where you were, uh, I guess the big question is, how did you get started? Like, I mean, is this a huge leap of faith going into that or did you happen to know the right people or what? Uh, I was working as the webmaster for uh, a minor video game company that was the daughter of Time Warner. And uh, I was active on the news groups for D&D and they had an opening for uh, what they called an online coordinator, but what we call a webmaster these days. And I applied on a lark and they gave me an interview and during the interview uh, it, live in Wisconsin, the guy says, well, you know, I have some other candidates, but that's pretty much a formality. You have this job if you want it. I'm like, well, I haven't talked to my girlfriend yet and we live in California, so uh, let me get back to you. And uh, I thought it over for three days and then said yes. And two weeks later, I was on the road to Wisconsin and I was TSR's webmaster and I started doing some freelance for the RPGA and helping out uh, the creative services department. And then when we moved to Wizards of the Coast in 94, seven uh there was a game design position open up and i started working on greyhawk and forgotten realms that's awesome so so it was just a bunch of co coincidences and and really good luck it was not an intentional sort of thing it just fate well, I, think, I think it's yeah, great yeah i was gonna say, oh, the, sorry, ability go ahead, to say uh, the ability to say yes you know that is a huge leap of uh what's the worst that could happen right <laughs> right I think it's great that you mentioned TSR because I mentioned TSR all the time because that's when I started in D&D with AD&D 2nd Edition clear back in the late 80s and 90s. I'm the old man of our podcast and Nolan loves to remind me of this. So finally, Nolan, I have company. I think I might out old man you. I just turned 50 this week. Oh, oh see, I just turned birthday. 40. Yeah, congrats on the birthday. I hit 46 uh, three weeks ago. Okay. Congrats on that. 46 is a good year. Well, you know what? I don't think it really feels any different than 21. It just takes me longer to get out of bed. Yeah, it's weird. I was 29 last week and now I'm 50. It's not fair. Exactly. Where did it all go? <laughs> so we did reach out to a lot of people that we know that, that are in the gaming world that love games. And, and one of the people that we know that loves games happens to be my youngest son. He's 18. He runs games all the time. And when he heard that we were going to be talking to you about Tolis, he got all excited. So last night, him and I sat down and we chatted. He goes, Dad, one of the things I've always wanted to know is, is with these people who, who get into game design and who do this for a living, as much time as you spend reading, researching, testing, et cetera, when it comes to RPGs, do you still play them in your leisure time? Oh, yeah. Oh, like, first of all, MCG, we have... I, I game with Monty and Bruce Cardell and Shauna and our friend Susan Morris. Every other week, we play Invisible Sun. Uh, before that, we were playing a, a different campaign of Invisible Sun. And before that, we played Numenera. So we've had actually the same gaming group going on for 
six or seven years. Uh, we're just via Zoom now. Um, I'm running a tallest game every other week for my girlfriend, her teenage son, and a couple of friends of mine from the Wizards of the Coast days. Uh, before that, it was a Numenera playtest group. Um, so yeah, it's 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 it is the work, but it is also my joy and my hobby, and I. I can't imagine not gaming at least once a month. Like we feel weird when we haven't been gaming. And then on top of that, MCG is like, we are a game company. We should be doing online games together, you know, at least once a month. And so we have play test times, but also some of it is just like, hey, we're gonna, you know, do this fun little one shot and things like that. So we all play a lot. That's awesome. He was so concerned because he talks about he's he's in college currently to be a singer and he was very concerned about because he loves gaming and he wants to do stuff and potentially write some some stuff for games. Cool. And he's he's worried that he would be completely burnt out. Like he told me last night, he says, Dad, I, I love singing. I love doing this, but all the voice lessons, all the performing and stuff like that that I do, I kind of feel like I get burnt out. And that was his big concern. I, I'd imagine, though, there are times where you do feel like you hit burnout. Yeah, there are. Um, but then I'll find a, a really fun TV show or a really great movie or a comic book or something like that. It just gets me really excited. And I, I can't help but think, oh, it'd be really cool if I put this in my game. Oh, I should start up a campaign again because I haven't played in three months. You know, it's it's a cycle. You have a lot of energy and time for stuff. And then life gets really busy and you lose some of that and it comes back. You mentioned um, watch a TV show, watch a movie, things like that. Uh, in fact, Aiden and I were talking last night. We were listening. There's a a big trend on TikTok right now for sea shanties. Um, there's yes. one in particular called The Weller Man. The Weller Man. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. We were talking last night as we were driving home because he hadn't heard that song yet. So I played The Weller Man for him. And he's like, wow, that's a really cool song. I said, yeah, this would really make a cool RPG setting if you had some sort of mysterious creature who was The Weller Man doing things that the party had to hunt. And he just looked at me. He's like, dad, that's awesome. <laughs> so I, yeah. I love the fact that you talked about drawing inspiration. Where else would you draw inspiration for game design? I mean, I, I'm kind of a, an infovore, so I read crazy articles, and, and we, have a, we have our own Slack for MCG, and all of us have our own channel, but we also have channels for, like, lovable stuff and Screaming Freezer and, you know, just eerie things that we can share and really cool things that we can share. And so we're always sharing news articles and scientific articles and just cool stuff that people are doing. I mean, we are at the luckiest point in human history so far in that we have all of this information at our fingertips through the through the internet so we can see someone reviving old sea shanties or you know building lego sets of famous artworks or making uh cookies in the shape of Catan pieces and doing cookies of Catan. i mean all of that is great stuff it makes me go oh i want to do like cakes of Catan and just do it large size for you know a, a convention or an mcg summit where everybody's like oh i'm gonna get you know a slice of cake because that's my two wood for this turn you know that'd be Goofy stuff like that. Nolan? Yeah, uh, my mind is reeling for possibilities now. I don't know if you want to win that game or lose that game, depending on how much it is. <laughs> it's, it's how you play. <laughs> well, I think uh, we saw Tolis coming out, and I was like, oh, this is really cool. They're bringing something forward. I had not gotten to play it back in the past. I was like, oh, I'll kickstart it. And then I looked at it, and there's this... 700 page tome that i'm curious i'm gonna have to like hire people to help me bring the box in when it gets here so uh for people that don't know that haven't heard of it who are just getting started what is tolus uh so back in 99 or so uh monty had been running a campaign uh in second edition DD, &D, and it kind of morphed into started to play test some third edition DD aspects we wrapped up that campaign and Monty said, okay, I want to start a new campaign that is 700 years in the future, same world. Uh, and so that was originally what Tallis was. Um, and then he changed his mind and said, actually, I want it to be 10,000 years in the future. So we fast forwarded 10,000 years. Um, but he ran two different groups simultaneously. Uh, one was Wednesday nights and one was Monday nights. And that campaign went on for two, three years. And... We had two very different groups. Um, uh, there was some crossover, I think. Like Bruce Cardell was playing in both, and I was very briefly in both, but mostly it was like, this is the gang who are all playing elves as PCs, and this is a gang of miscellaneous other people doing other stuff, and they had just these two different paths. Like the elves were all kind of semi-criminal and involved on all this shady stuff and crime lords, and we were literally like trying to save the world from destruction by these evil gods. 
Uh, there were occasional crossovers where we'd all meet up and it'd be all 10 of us fighting this gigantic battle. And uh, it was wild. It was great. Um, and he ran another campaign set in that world a few years later. And at some point, he just took his extensive notes and started to fill them in and make them an actual book that could be published. And uh, Talos was that book. Um, even before the era of Kickstarters, Monty had this idea of, well, this is going to be a really expensive book to produce. How about we just open up a pre-order store? And if we get a certain number of pre-orders, then we'll hit the button and we'll actually do a print run of this. And the people got it. And it was, you know, the physical book was 670 some odd pages with a bunch of supplemental PDFs. And there's a great story it has the, the Gen Con that it came out. They brought us a small selection that they had left over for sale. And they had a, a contest where they gave people a copy of Talos and you had to hold it at arm's length. And whoever was the, la the person who held out the longest was the person who got won that copy of Talos. And one by one, these people are holding this book and they're like, I just can't do it anymore, can't do it anymore. And it finally got to be these last two guys and completely unprompted, both these guys are like this and they turned to face each other. They were just staring dead at each other in the eye for the last, this, finally one guy just couldn't do it anymore and he's, the last guy was victorious and got his copy of Talos. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so it's this campaign setting set in this magical city where it's D&D &D turned up to 11. I mean, it says, yes, there are barbarians and there's a 20th little barbarian living in the city and there are wizards and there are sorcerers and there are monks and bards. And these are all things that are you know, real. Everybody's completely aware and familiar with. There's like basically an adventurer's guild. There are dungeons under the city. There's weird stuff even beneath that. This is the place where adventurers go. And yet, at the same time, you can also have an entire campaign that has nothing to do with the dungeons. You can be dealing with crime lords, whether as allies or enemies. You can be trying to finagle your way into one of the noble houses. Um, all sorts of crazy stuff in this city. Like, I played in one of these campaigns for two to three years, and I started, I, I avoided reading the book because of spoilers. But when I started working on these conversions last year, I started reading the book from the front page to the last page, and I kept running into stuff like, oh yeah, that was what our group did. That was what our group did. But there's, you know, two thirds of the book is, I have never heard this before. We never actually even got to this. Like you can run multiple campaigns in Talos that don't even touch on the same material. You might have a couple of the same NPCs show up because there are some key ones like the guy who runs the magic shop, for example. But there's just so much material there that you could easily do one without any sort of repeat content. That's awesome. Sean, you mentioned, you've mentioned the name Monty, and, and, and I know Nolan and I know who Monty is, but for those who don't know, could you really quick tell us who Monty is? So Monty uh, Cook is uh, my friend and my boss, and I've known him since I started at TSR in 1995. He got there a few years before me. Uh, before that, he worked on Rollmaster for Iron Crown. Um, in the TSR days, he was known for mostly for Planescape. He was one of the lead designers on the Planescape line. And then when we rolled over to Wizards of the Coast, he was working on core D&D, and he was the author of the third edition Dungeon Master's Guide. So the original third edition design team, um, original is kind of a fuzzy term, but Skip Williams wrote the Player's Handbook, Monty wrote the Dungeon Master's Guide. I'm sorry, I'm messing this up. Jonathan Tweet wrote the Player's Handbook. Uh, Jonathan Tweet, who is the author of the Everway game, by the way. Skip Williams, the sage from Dragon Magazine, wrote the Monster Manual, and Monty wrote the Dungeon Master's Guide. And of course, all three of them worked together as a collaboration in all this, plus Rich Baker and Peter Atkinson, head of Wizards of the Coast, and so on, because we're all, we're all in there. But uh, Monty wrote the DMG. Uh, he was stuck around at Wizards for a couple more years and then split off to do his own thing. He started self-publishing under Malhavik Press, and he pretty much pioneered the idea of, oh, I don't want to make a print book for this. I'm going to sell it as a PDF. How much should I charge for this 32-page PDF? Uh, how about $5? And people said, yes, I will pay $5 for this PDF. And so that led to the Book of Elders Might and the Book of Elders Might 2 and some stuff that I self-published through his little company. Um, and he's just been a pioneer for RPGs for so long. His first Kickstarter was Numenera, and his initial goal was $20,000. Like, I want to make this weird science fantasy book that's Earth 1 billion years in the future. And they hit that goal on the first day, and then it just kept going more and more and more. And that Kickstarter hit $500,000. That was the first Kickstarter for RPGs to just blow up like that. And it was at that point they said, okay, well, we can't do this alone. We should hire some people. And so they hired Charles Ryan to be their you know, part of their uh, 
core leadership team, and then the company has grown to what we are now. I think we have 10 people now. We're still a small company. We work remotely. We meet through Zoom, and then we, when we aren't having a pandemic, we'll have an in-person summit once or twice a year. Um, but we all love games, and we're small and agile, and we just allows us to kind of react to conditions of the world and, and make products that we would love to play in. That's awesome. I, I read somewhere recently that um, on Monty's DMG that even Gary Gygax said that his, Monty's DMG made him a better DM. Nice. Yeah, I nice. thought that was one hell of a compliment. Yeah, I, I still go back to the third edition DMG and read it for advice because Monty Monty's a great GM. Like he has been GMing for me off and on when I was living in the same state as him since 95. He actually, he uh, and his, his core group of close friends at the time brought me under their wing when I was the new guy from California who didn't know anybody at all at the company. And they invited me over to their house and I play tested a module by Bruce that he was working on. So it's, yeah, they're good people. So why the decision to bring Tallis from, because it was, if I'm not mistaken, a 3.5 edition D&D &D style setting. What, why the decision to bring it to 5th edition? Uh, basically because people had been asking. Like there are people who have had the original Tallis and they said, you know, I love the setting, but my group wants to play 5e and I don't want to put in the work to convert a 672 plus page book to 5e. Um, and so we're like, all right, we'll do it. And there were people who hadn't had the original Tallis and they were telling us that we would love to play this game. Um, but you know, we could, we wanted to have it a physical copy that's with the updated rules. You can actually, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but for a while you could get a two volume set of Tallis because the print on demand options through drive through could not handle a 672 page book. So they had to put it into like volume A and volume B. But a lot of people are just like, I want to have the deluxe edition that people had from 2006. I want to have the bookmarks. I want to have the packet. And so we had had a successful Kickstarter for our Arcana of the Ancients line, which is basically weird science fantasy technology stuff from Numenera plugged into 5e. And so we knew that we had a 5e audience just of our own players. And we thought that 5e players would be intrigued by this gigantic city campaign. And we decided to do a Kickstarter of it. And since our house system is a cipher system, we said, well, you know, we should do both versions of the game or both, both games for this Kickstarter. And so we didn't just convert Tallis to 5e. We've also converted Tallis to cipher system. And they are two very radically different game systems. And so it was a crazy nutty project and it, it more than doubled the work, but it's worth it. They, they are both beautiful books. Uh, they're at proofing right now. Um, and then they're going to go to the printer in, I think, about a month. And I'm really, really proud to work on these. But yeah, they've been a lot of work. We, we had this adage, Monty had this adage on the original Tallis, that Tallis takes twice as long for everything in the production process. Twice as long to edit, twice as long to prove, twice as long to get art done. And that's not that anybody's doing anything bad. It's just there's so much material there that you have to be really diligent on catching all these little things. Like, oh, but I said this person's name was so-and-so over here. Oh, it's the same character but this one instance in the 35 mentions has a typo you know or there was an autocorrect issue that sort of thing so it takes twice as long now that we're doing two different versions of the book at the same time using basically the same layout that it just adds another factor of complexity so it's even taking us even longer and we're all just i mean good thing i'm already bald because otherwise that would have just torn all my hair up right now i can relate <laughs> yeah, uh, and the Kickstarter was insanely successful, and I know uh, Nolan backed it for 307 RPG. In fact, he, he mentioned that he's going to need help bringing the box in because, Nolan, you got, what, like five copies of the Player's Handbook coming, something like that? You went really high. Yeah, and I, I felt like, again, I was somebody that missed the 3.5 uh, and really kind of regret it once I realized what was coming and, and, and the, the accolades and the response and, and everything like that was just okay, it's its own beast. It deserves that. And for players to be a part of it, it's not, it doesn't seem like your normal D&D. &D. It, it does seem like something that you need to kind of understand what you're getting into because there will be the the orc next to the minotaur next to the elf and everybody's cool because there's a, there's a much larger threat in its presence. So I, I think that's fun. It gets away from stereotypes and allows you to open up the monster manual and be like, yeah, this is what I am. And there's an excuse for that. So Yes, I know it's gonna the UPS man's gonna knock on his door when it shows up. Yeah, we've kind of established a tradition of having 
big, huge deliveries for, for our various products. The Numenera uh, Discovery and Destiny was two 400 page hardbacks as, as a, in a slipcase. Invisible Sun was a 30 pound box set of all that stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of angry postal workers who are glaring at everybody who's ordered these things. And a lot of happy gamers. Yeah, and happy I'm gamers, yes. Well, I think no. my, you kind of touched on my question already of uh, the doing the new edition. How, I mean, bringing it forward, do you guys end up setting up a, a formula of conversion from, you know, AC from three to five, or is each page painstakingly like, yeah, that doesn't make sense in this edition? Uh, or, you know, do you guys find ways to make the shortcuts or is it everything just its own monster? I mean, there really aren't any shortcuts. We had come up with a general, like, this is what, for, for uh, Arcana of the Ancients, which is taking the Numenera material and converting it to 5e. And so we said, all right, a level 10 creature in Numenera is probably CR 25 to 30 in 3e, that sort of thing. But within that, there's just a lot of variability. And uh, <clears throat> for Tallis, so many of the creatures are so weird that we had to just basically redesign things from scratch to fit 5e or to fit cypher system because there's a lot of stuff that isn't in the game anymore like 3e went all in on having ability damage like oh this monster attacks your strength score this monster attacks your intelligence score and 5e doesn't really have ability damage like that there are a couple of creatures like the shadow that do reduce your strength stat but it's not like oh i've taken three points of con damage i know what that means so if there's a monster that does con damage now, it's like, well, what do we do with that? Well, I have to go and have it do necrotic damage, or it has to also let it at levels of exhaustion, that sort of thing. Um, prestige classes aren't a thing in 5th edition. In 3rd edition, you know, you could have fighter, paladin, and so on, and then there is a class you could qualify for at level 5 or higher that would give you different things. And so, and so Talos went all in on that. There are three different prestige classes that you could join that represent like this particular wizard's guild or this group of like martial song bards but that's not a thing in fifth edition anymore so we had to figure out a way to make those prestige classes something that the players could still join in on without having to go and rebuild the third edition prestige class rules like one thing we decided was we are not going to build a set of house rules for playing third edition as fifth edition so we're not going to say here's prestige classes for 5e Here's this concept that we're just directly importing. We're like, no, the 5e doesn't have that. We're just going to make this work in the 5e format. And what we ended up doing is the Knights of the Court, which is what they're called, these, these song bards. Um, it is the subclass for bards. And so at level one, you could be like, I'm going to become a Knight of the Court. And you, as you get your levels up, your abilities are associated with that. And then Cypher System doesn't even have anything like that. So it's like, all right, well, we're just going to make a new set of abilities that come from this and plug them in this way. Um, so there was no simple conversion. There was no easy conversion, um, no formula for that. It was just, we had to know fifth edition really well, mm -hmm. like read the books cover to cover and find something that was a, a reasonable example for how things work and then plug it into that. Um, I did the 5e conversions of the spells and actually I thought that was really, really fun because 5e has this concept where you can have like one of the reasons that 5e doesn't have a lot of high level spells is because a lot of high level spells in previous editions were just spells that did more damage. And now 5e is just like, let's make that a low level spell and you can use a higher level spell slot to cast it and that'll give you X, Y, or Z. So there are a lot of tallest spells that were like six, seven, eight, ninth level, and now they're third, fourth, fifth level. And you just add spell slots to it, which I thought was really, really Scale, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it meant that some of the things that like cleric domains where you had a spell a new spell at every spell level now we don't have that because everything kind of gets shifted down a bit so we had to like push some stuff around I mean, it's there's it a really fun design challenge to make these things work and i get very geeky in my head about game design questions like this and i don't know if your audience is into that but it's the sort of stuff that i love i love converting systems from one to the other and it was a lot of work a lot of work especially doing it simultaneously and in some cases, like I would do a chapter's 5e conversion and uh, then Bruce would do the cypher system conversion. In some cases, Bruce would do the cypher system conversion first and then I would do the 5e. Uh, and then in, in some cases, because I was doing a 5e, sorry, a cypher system play test, I was already working on uh, my tallest home game. So I just told Bruce, look, I'll already do the 5e and I'll just do the cypher system conversion of the adventures in the book because I'm running them right now. And he said, all right, you saved me two weeks of work, so. 
that's got to be difficult when you have to convert, like you said, from this to the cipher system and 5e. How many times did you find yourself going, oh, wait, that's that's the wrong rule set. I can't use that here. Oh, all the time. And we play an Invisible Sun game every two weeks. And so we keep mixing our terminology. Like, we sent this off to the, the proofer a few weeks ago. And Ray is a very diligent proofer. And he was also the editor. And so he was just coming to us with editing questions in the previous cycle saying, here you say this is an intelligence check. This is a cipher system book. We don't have intelligence and we don't have checks. It's like, oh, that should be an intellect task, right? All the time. Like we tried, to, we tried really hard to not do that. But in, you know, 672 plus pages, you're going to slip up. And that's why we have editors and proofers. So it happens a lot. And sometimes we have, um, we're doing this weird thing with a book where we wanted a lot, as much of the content as possible to be parallel. So if you're looking at page... 135 in the cipher system book and it's talking about the nobles district if you go to page 135 in the 5e book it's talking about the nobles district it's generally the same section um and there are places where we couldn't do that just because we have a character stat block is too long or something gets pushed around a little bit but the front part of the book like the front three quarters of the book is basically the same layout and our art director, graphic designer Bayer, did a really cool thing where we have our margin callouts for one system and for the other system, and he has them on different layers in InDesign, the layout program. And so when it's time to send the Cypher System book to the printer, he will hide the 5e layer. And so only all the Cypher System callouts are there. And then he'll do the reverse for the 5e version. And of course, there are some callouts that are system neutral, like saying, so and so also runs this shop in the other district. Both books will have that. So we actually have three different sets of callouts: one for both books, one for Cypher System, one for Five E. Um, I'm not sure where I was going with this, other than it's really, really crazy. Um, but it it meant basically that Bear only had to lay out the first three quarters of the book once, instead of having a fully Cypher System version and a fully Five E version where things the pages aren't going to match up. It's just you can you can have a generally parallel sort of experience. So there are people who are going to have both versions that are going to go, oh, these people actually put in the work to make these comparable. I'm, I'm on the website right now for Monaco Games, just kind of scrolling through the pre-order because it is available currently for pre-order and just looking at the artwork. Um, and of course, a lot of this artwork, like uh, I noticed Todd Lockwood's name, who's infamous in role-playing artwork. And, and, and I'm just astounded at the beauty of some of the artwork that I'm seeing here. And and it, it, those of you who are in chat, those of you who are listening right now, I encourage you to go to Monte Cook Games right now and just take a look at the artwork that is previewed here. It is amazing. So when I add that, not only did Todd do the the cover art of the, the character and the Black Dragon and, and some of the interior art, Todd actually, if you look at the cover of Talus, there's like a stone texture, like cobblestones of a a dungeon or a, you know the city street todd also did that so he's technically on the cover twice and then we had some one of our stretch goals was to add some even newer art and so we've got uh an updated erlenius star of Avastrum, who is this uh he's an ogre mage who has been converted away from evil and so he serves the god of harmony he's this famous guy who walks around with a bunch of iron stones around his head uh, Jevika Nor is a member of the Inverted Pyramid Wizards Guild, and she's this uh, really powerful wizard who's got this magically animated glass arm that she created. Um, we have a couple of city-level views of Talos and one of like an aerial view, just in case you're like a wizard who goes flying over the city. Yeah, this art is, is fantastic. I normally actually use uh, some of that Talos art as my background for when I'm running my Talos game, but uh, we do our games through Zoom, and so I can swap backgrounds more easily there. I don't know how to do it on Discord because I don't often use Discord. I don't think so. we know how to use it either. So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm actually jumped over to Todd's website right now because I know I recognize his art style and I'm looking at it like he's done a lot of work for Magic the Gathering, Path of mm -hmm. Exile, Kalidas, as well as uh, Nolan, you'll geek out totally on this because he does a lot of Dritz Duerden artwork. I'm okay with that. Lot. I'm that guy at our group. 
Yeah, he really is. <laughs> uh, Aiden was asking me this morning as he was heading out to work. He said, Dad, I have another question. He says, because um, I don't know, he, said, he doesn't know a lot about Tolis. And he's wondering, he says, is the static, is the setting very static? Is it set in stone? Or is it something that changes and grows? Is it a living world that like a decision made by characters today could affect what happens tomorrow? How is that set up within the system, within the game? Uh, so it, the initial setup is here's Talus, and we haven't changed that. Like the new versions are going to be still having this, this same assumption of this is day zero when you start your Talus campaign. Um, so we're not invalidating any stuff that anybody else's campaign has been. Like there are people who have Talus campaigns that are still going on. And we don't want to say, okay, it's five years past that. And they would say like, we're only at year, you know, one and a half. I don't want you advancing our timeline. So this Talus is still the same content as the original one. Um, <clears throat> there is so much going on in the city. I mean, it includes a calendar and it talks about holidays and there are a lot of events that happen uh, at specific times. And uh, I don't, I almost just blurted a spoiler uh, for one of those events. I don't want to spoil it for people who potentially are playing. But there are things in the book that Monty says, if you want to have your campaign bring this in, a good time to do that would be two years after you start, two years of game time after you start. Uh, there are sections in the book that talk about, you know, long-term repercussions. If you kill off a bunch of these crime lord minions, will there be any replacements? Can you take out the leader? Will there be a new gang who comes in? What other rival gangs will happen? There's a path where if you want to end up joining one of the noble families, or at least, you know, kind of pretending to join the noble family. Uh, there is there's a lot of stuff going on that has timelines built in. But like I said earlier, it all depends on which part of the campaign you want to do. Um, so Talos is very much a live setting and there are things happening and there's stuff that's happening beyond your character's control. So there will be events that happen and they're, they're just going to react to that. He'll be excited to hear that. <laughs> Nolan, you asked, uh, you reached out to your friend Ryan and he had some questions as well. Do you want to go ahead and present some of those? Yeah, uh, so my buddy Ryan is uh, in video game design and they are used to playing with the constraints of that world that they build and then watching players come in and break it and abuse it and stuff like that. And so his question was, uh, you know, when you have games like this, you know, maybe not necessarily Tolish just because it has been tested and played for so long, um, but how do you balance and play test such large mechanically heavy worlds um, and then like campaigns take a long time? like you know, hey, we got this game coming out. Do you have six months to play test it and say, yeah, we got it all? Do you play test it for two, three years? Like, what is your timeline to try and hit everything that you're going to release to the wild? Because most of the time, these things are very solid products when they come out. Is it a group effort? Do you let people in and have them sign? Hey, you can't talk about it. You can't stream it, this kind of stuff, or I guess. Yeah, I mean, for, for Tallis, it's kind of a unique situation in that Monty literally ran three campaigns set in this world and all of that information fed into the original version of the book. So we already have a lot of like corners filled out. Like he talks about, hey, what if your PCs are the type that like to turn invisible and steal from shops or just murder people on the street? It's like, well, you can do that, but Talus is a world where magic exists. There's a you know high level wizards guild. The the city and the, the Empire government hire people to just kind of lurk around shops not in every shop but there is a like a subset of the police basically that kind of hang around invisibly and watch for people using charm magic on on store owners and things like that and you could be arrested there is a there is a prison for you know powerful wizards that can't be killed um there there i mean there's consequences for all this stuff and so we've there are people who like to break campaign settings and there are things that kind of steer that in. I mean, the fact that in the original 3E Talus, there w there's a high level, and by I mean 18 to 20, represent representative of every single PC character class in the player's handbook. And so part of that is, oh, you know what? I want to be the biggest, baddest barbarian in the city. Someday I'm going to take that guy down. Or... I want to be a really powerful wizard. Oh, I can join this guild of wizards and hang out with these other 15th and higher level wizards. Like those powerful people exist. They're not just going to go, oh, look, someone is fireballing everybody in the city. Hey, that's my house. Stop. Oh, I'll just say stop again. I mean, these people have the power to stop crazed adventurers from just running rampant. Um, 
like the town guard's going to go, whoa, this is above our pay grade. We're going to talk to the boss and he's going to call in, you know, some favors and the wizards and the barbarians and the high, the 20th level monk are going to show up and, and deal with it. There's a, a group called the Sisterhood of Silence and they are these uh, women monks who have a vow of silence and they are just these badasses. And they'll just come in and they've got crossbows with stun bolts and they'll just use a uh, quivering palm and just take people out who are just too much of a threat. I mean, the city literally is built over a dungeon full of monsters, and some of these sections break out, monsters come out of stasis, and so they'd be like, there's a troll on, you know, Wood Street, and they know what to do. Like, they get fire, they grab some, you know, some acid, they deal with this stuff. Um, so the city has evolved through the original campaigns to deal with that sort of stuff. Um, in terms of saying, here's the 5e version and here's the CS version, can we play test everything going off the rails for 672 pages? No, because I could run on a campaign for an entire year and not cover half the content in this book easily. But we've been doing this for a while and we have the original framework. We know that it handles, you know, these, these problems. Um, specific play testing is more for, does this aspect of the adventure work in 5e? Does this aspect of this adventure work in Cyber System? Do all PC types have something to do for this series of adventures? And that's what we play tested. And we also sent some materials out to uh, the same people who gave us a really critical eye for Arcana of the Ancients, which was our first 5e stuff when we were still kind of getting our feet. And they gave us feedback too. So play testing is, is not like working in video games. I worked in video games and the testers are often like looking for bugs and can I walk through this wall and that sort of stuff? Or is there an exploit where my character can do 500 points of damage in one attack? Um, most of that stuff is covered by the framework of the RPG itself. It's in the player's handbook. Um, but there are always going to be weird little quirky things of, oh, if I use this spell and against this creature, it's going to do something weird. And as an RPG designer, you have to accept that, you know what? Sometimes things are going to get weird but GMs are empowered to deal with that. Like that's why we have a human GM to say, you know what, you shouldn't do that. And even if, even if the GM has to literally tell the players, you know, you're kind of breaking the campaign by just murdering people in the street and turning invisible and teleporting away. That's not the sort of game that I want to run. Can we, can we get back to doing adventures instead of street murder, please? So, the, as Monty used to say a lot is the GM is not a robot. So the GM Absolutely. is an active participant in the game and can say, hey, let's let's gently steer things towards this sort of thing. Bring it back I in. I still boys. agree with that. Yep. <laughs> Nolan, I know Ryan had a few questions, so go ahead and run with them. Yeah. Um, let's see here. His other part of that. Uh, you know, I think you kind of answered a lot of that in that in that section just because he was talking about building everything to scale and stuff like that. So um, I ramble. A no, it's it's perfect. It. it you hit on the stuff and, and, and it's great. Um, you know, I think when we look at this here, um, if I tell somebody, Hey, we're going to play this game, it's 700 pages. I might scare some people off. Um, so in the 700 pages, is it like you said, you know, is it just, here's Tolos jump in and go, is there adventure in there? You've already kind of mentioned a little bit about bringing prestigious classes into subclasses. Is there something for everybody in this book or is it just, this is the DM's library and he's flipping through it as a tome. Um, I guess 700 pages is scary. Uh, so. Yeah. So that 700 pages covers, like the first chapter is what we call the tallest player's handbook. And we actually took all that material and that's what's in the tallest player's guide, the separate 32 page system neutral guide for tallest. And that is really what all the players initially need to know. It's like, you know, this is a city and there are a couple of minotaurs walking around that are, you know, not evil. And uh, this is this district and this is that district. And your character would know that these are the various noble families and what each of those noble families is about. Like House Ladam, oh, everybody knows that. Oh, they're, you know, associate with demons. And House Sadar, they probably do shadow magic. And House Katru is, they're all the martial people. Um, and it talks about some of the guilds and, and that sort of thing. So really when it comes to being a player, there's a 32 page player guide that you can read to be fully informed about everything that you need to know to start playing. Um, there's some additional material in the tallest book for players that talks about, Hey, I want to play a shoal elf because uh, in tallest, there aren't high elves and wood elves. There are shoal elves and there are carabin, which are uh, winged elves. And there are harrow elves, which are these elves that were tortured and mutilated uh, by this half God 
a couple of centuries ago and they breed true. And so there's just these hideous sort of elven creatures full of bitterness. Um, and so they've got PC stats for those and PC stats for the, the types of dwarves. And there's a, a cat folk called Lytorians, these big lion type plains runner people. Um, so there are PC stats for that, but the GM can just show you that page of the book. Um, everything else in the book is pretty much GM specific information. It says here, GM, let's talk about the Warrens. This is the slum part of the city. And here's a bunch of locations. Here are some key NPCs. Here's a table talking about um, various businesses and uh, locations that the PCs can visit if you want to run a Warren's focus campaign and then does the same thing for Old Town and Midtown and the Nobles Quarter and the docks and then it says oh by the way there's the spire here's what's up with the spire and here's like one dungeon on top of that and the even more scary dungeon on top of that and here's the dungeon underneath the city and all these chapters are for the GMs and there is a chapter um it's kind of a weird setup because there is a chapter that is literally here are adventures and there's like a, a string of adventures that would take a, a 5e campaign i think from like first to eighth level or so but the section talking about scary dungeon number one of the spire is literally like here's room 15 here's room 16. so although that's not presented as an adventure that is adventure content the end of that chapter says here are five different reasons why your pcs might go into goth gogomel and it gives you like a plot seed and it links it into other things like, oh, the Iron Mage says that there's a staff of the Magi and he wants it and you can get it one here, but you have to go and brave these horrible, horrible challenges. Um, the section talking about uh, the Undercity, which is kind of an area of the dungeon that's been cleared out and actually has like merchant shops and stuff. But, you know, beyond a couple of brick walls, there are monsters. Um, there's a rat man nest that's fully described. There's the thieves guild that you can explore. And so, although those things aren't in the adventures chapter, there's still adventure content that is literally like, I'm going to kick down a door and go door to door, like a dungeon in other parts of the book. Um, so there's tons of adventure content in that in the book, whether it's presented as here's the adventure chapter, here's the plot of what's going on, or we just want to be dungeoneers and explore stuff. So there's. A lot of stuff and the we're working on conversions um so you backed it in the kickstarter which meant that you got all the original content as well mm -hmm. so you've got like the bane warrants which is a 96 page pdf a night of dissolution which is like 120 page pdf we're going to be converting both of those books to 5e and cypher system and we're coming out with three new adventures for 5e and cypher, cypher system as well so there's tons of adventure content like in the book and outside the book as supplemental material you kind of talked about, uh, you know, levels one through eight. You say there's level 20s in, in, in the area. I feel like 5e, we haven't seen anything for that high-end stuff. Um, you know, say I do finally get to take a character level 20. I haven't seen that any of that stuff. Do you guys have that ability in this game? I mean, is that the, the end boss I'm looking at? You're not touching that guy until you're 18 plus. Yeah, there's there are kind of two pathways in Talos. One is delving down underneath to see why all this bad stuff keeps happening and why all this bad stuff is, is drawn to Talos. Like there's, there's literally a group, uh, a city of dark elves down there that use powerful magic to steal an entire elven city, Dreda Fantas, from the surface world. And they've hidden it away somewhere under Talos because Talos, I don't want to say any spoilers, but there's something really, really even worse than that underneath Talus that will destroy everything. And the key to it is Dreda Fantas. They just haven't figured out how to unlock it yet. So one adventure path towards high level stuff is going and dealing with these drow, getting into Dreda Fantas and releasing it and dealing with the horrible things that are being contained there. The other is what's up the spire. And uh, the adventure of the Bane Warrens partially deals with that. Like the idea of the Bane Warrens there was this uh, priest who said, oh, there's evil in the world. I'm going to contain it so it doesn't taint other things. And he built this vault called the Bane Warrens, where he gathered all these evil magic items and evil creatures called Banes and locked them away. Well, that much concentrated evil in such a close area, the earth itself rejected it. And so that is what caused the spire. This is like the earth expelling like a splinter from its finger. And it's just like, I'm gonna push all of this as far away from me as it can. Well, the presence of all those banes actually corrupted 
this this priest man from a couple thousand years ago. His name was Dinar. And he became basically the ultimate evil bad guy of the campaign setting. Um, his name was, uh, it was Islathagos Malkith, uh, also known as the Dread One. And he created all this evil stuff, all these evil artifacts. He corrupted uh, like a solar. And so now there's an evil solar in, in his, in Jabal Shabar, the dungeon at the peak of uh, Talos. Um, he actually theoretically has been slain um, but you can still go in there and find like the remnants of his soul, which are still actively malignant and gaining power. Like the spire has this castle on top and most people just kind of ignore it over, you know, many years of living there. But recently, this is one of the seeds of the book is recently weird green lights have been appearing in Jabal Shamar. And people are like, oh, that's just lightning. But no, that's not lightning. That's your level 20 content. Like the idea is like you come to Talos, you start a game in Talos. And from the very beginning of the campaign, you're like, what's up there that's where like literally the evil has been looming the entire time that's great uh, you know i'm i'm more than likely going to be the dm for our group when we play tallest and and everything you've talked about sounds like it's going to be a lot of work for the dm to get himself him or herself ready to play this game and i gotta tell you i'm excited to get myself ready to play this because everything you've said just sounds absolutely incredible and it's yeah, this this is exciting. Um, we do have some questions for Twitter, and Sean, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but oh no, it's I, fine. I, I say I suspect we could probably talk about this all day because <laughs> Nolan and I okay. love this stuff. But before we go to Twitter questions, I want to point out so yes. one thing. So there, there that's Jabel Shamar. Beneath halfway up the spire is Goth Golgamel, which is the the lair of Ghoul G H U L, the half god, who about five hundred years ago said, "Wow, you know." Uh, Asafagos with Keith, he's my kind of guy. Oh, I'm his son. I'm the next generation of him. So I'm going to be just as evil as him and everyone's going to fear me. And he like literally blanketed like a country sized part of the world in darkness for over a hundred years called the utter dark. And, but even despite how evil and badass he was, he was only able to get halfway up the spire. So his place is halfway up the spire, Goth Golgomel. Um, in the tallest game that I played in, our group got into Goth Golgamel, and there uh, we got we ended up fighting all this horrible stuff because he had all these traps and everything there. And there is one room where, like, the adventurers who killed him left his stuff scattered. They're like, "That's too evil for us even to pick up," <laughs> right? So our group got to that room where he was dead, and my character's like, "Oh, this is cool chainmail," and it killed me. <laughs> and then to turn me, it killed me immediately. Like I failed a horrible, I turned into a dread wraith and I started attacking the rest of the party. Well, fortunately we had a really powerful cleric in our group. And so she just did turn on dead and just completely obliterated me. And then she's like, all right, let's get our friend back and just cast resurrection on me right there. So we were able just to casually cast, you know, this and that and resurrect a party, like without even preparing for it. We were high, we were 15th level at this point. Uh, so and again, we were only halfway up the spire. The real powerful stuff was even higher up above that. So fun, fun little game anecdote where literally my character died and was resurrected five minutes later. And we're like, all right, let's keep working. Okay. So is this, that was a neat is, piece of chain mail. I'll touch it again. Yeah, exactly. This really reminds me of uh, like Tomb of Annihilation where it's like, this is where you go to really test if you got the the, the skills to, to be this high level. Um, wow. <laughs> that's that's insane so um yeah <laughs> you really derailed me with that let's jump over to the uh the twitter questions uh, skyhammer press asked what can you tell us about the new adventures coming from the kickstarter uh not a lot actually because we haven't started writing them yet uh when when we hit those kickstarter bruce's was first and then monty's then mine we're like uh, okay so we're gonna have a kickstarter goal that bruce is gonna write a new adventure for talus so bruce is like um this is a general idea so we'll write a description based on that and I did the same thing when my stretch goal came up. Uh, and then since then, we've been working on the actual tallest book and other projects. Uh, we probably aren't going to start writing those for another month or so. So uh, what that really means is we haven't come up with a, a lot of the details yet. So if you want to tweet at me or Bruce with some sort of stuff that you would like to see in a new Talos adventure, that would be totally appropriate. Cool. Well, there you go. And we'll be sure to get your Twitter information and other contact information before we're done. Uh, Skyhammer Press also asked, did the Bane Warrens or, or the Night of Dissolution big adventures change much? 
Uh, we haven't started converting those yet either um, because we needed to make sure that everything for Talos was correct and that Talos was done. So we have page references that are correct for everything. So when we get to Bane Warrants and that dissolution, we can say, well, if you go to the such and such shop in Midtown, page 135, we actually have the right page number there. So we haven't started converting those yet. Um, so with Talos itself, the rules content is obviously going to change. We're talking about prestige classes, and now we have warlocks and, and that sort of thing. Um, for the most part, the story is going to be the same because we don't want to radically change the story. Uh, specific aspects of certain encounters might change a little bit from one to the other because if there was an, uh, an encounter that relied a lot on ability damage, for example, that wouldn't be a thing in 5e. So we'd have to find some other consequence for the NPCs to use against the PCs to make what was the ability damage and a big threat is now a suitable threat for 5e and a suitable set for a cyber system. That's all part of the conversion process. So just saying, is this encounter still cool and does it still work under the new game system? Okay. Uh, Dagnus Cauldron asks, will this be just a direct mechanics update or will the overall story have developed as well? I realize to a degree it can't advance that much, but will there be new tasty fluff for fans from the first edition of the big book? Big book in capital letters here. Right. Um, so like I said, we can't really change the source content because that might invalidate some campaigns. That we did add a few more things of clarification here and there where it seemed that like this person's motivation might not have been 100% clear, or if the clarity for that is referred to and explained to more in this other chapter. Um, as a person reading it from scratch, from start to finish, I did run into some places. Of, I know we talked about this person somewhere else. Fortunately, I could search the PDF and we added a lot of cross things. I mean, poor bear doing the layout for this. There are some places where the entire margin is filled up with callouts just because we're explaining stuff. And so whether that's, we added, we added, 5e stats for something in a call out or CS stats for something in a call out, or we added more explanatory information in a call out. Some of those sections are really, really dense. Um, one of the things we ended up doing is we ended up creating an NPC appendix for the book. Uh, so there's, cre there's the creatures chapter and we added some high level NPCs that, for example, there is the head of one of the noble houses whose stats appear in the chapter talking about the noble houses. And his stats take up almost an entire page in 5e. Um, but in the Cypher system, he's like two paragraphs. Well, we can't have the book shifting by a page and a half so early in the layout. So one of the things we did is we took that character's stats and added them to the end of the creature's chapter. So it's like, oh, so-and-so, see the creature's chapter. So we can be a little more flexible back there. Um, that also offered us the opportunity to say, you know what, the section that talks about his motivations and his goals, that can go in with the NPC stats. Um, there are a couple of places where some spoilery information is in the, the chapter that talks about what your PC stats are for various species. Um, so I said, hey, let's not put a big reveal of the adventure that happens here in this first chapter. And that's because the GM was supposed to be curating that information for the PCs. But I said, just in case the players are looking at the book, let's move some of this content around. So we try to, you know, update it to be a little more GM friendly, a little more player friendly, a little more spoiler warning for that sort of situation. So there, there have been adjustments to the content, but not in a way that makes the original book's timeline, potential timeline invalid. We will have, um, since we have these three new adventures coming out, that it will be an opportunity to, to say, here's some new like if you explore a new area, like, oh, here's this dungeon under Midtown, for example, you could have some lore associated with that and have some of the local characters, NPCs be interested in that. So that's where we'll have the opportunity to add some new stuff to Talus that has never been seen before. That's not just adventure content. Nolan, I know you and I had talked a little bit about <laughs> some of your favorite stuff and that being loot. And you had, you had said you had a question about that. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, as a 3.5 guy, I guess you get used to seeing magical items everywhere. Like it's just a thing. And then fifth edition, I really miss having magical items. What is, and I guess with magic, you mentioned a magical item shop, uh, and high level wizards. What is that? Is it a high magic situation? Is it converted to bring it down to be more realistic? Or is it like, you know what, this is all, all hands on deck. We're making magical items. They're raining from the sky. 
So Talus is definitely a very high magic setting. Like the idea is, because 3E was very high magic. We totally embrace the idea that you're going to have a bunch of magical loot. You could sell it, you could craft it, that sort of thing. Um, 5E is not like that. So we had to, we didn't want to break 5E, but we didn't want to lose that aspect of Talus. So we did a couple of things. One is we said, look, low level potions and scrolls, those are really, really common. And here are GP prices for those in Talus. And they basically parallel the three E prices. So it's like, I want to go buy a potion of this. That's 300 gold. I want to buy a scroll of this. That's 750 gold. That's there. We talk about how common magic items like plus one weapons, plus one armor, boots of elven kind, cloak of elven kind, ring of protection. Those things run from one to 3000 gold. So we have like the basic low level cash money economy for magic items is there. Um, another thing that we did is we said, hey, 5e uses attunement, which is a way to go and restrict how many uh, magic items a particular PC can have. We say, if you want to kind of go all in on magic items in the campaign, you can either increase the number of items that a PC can have as their attunement, perhaps based on level, like a level five, you get another attunement slot, levels 10, 15, or you could just get rid of it entirely. And it says that does change the power dynamic, but it is an option. Um, we didn't go back and say, oh, here's the staff of the Magi. It's 76,000 gold. You can buy it from the shop. It's, it's not like that. It's just because it, it, 5e is very hand wavy on a lot of the availability. But the adventures have magic items. The NPCs have magic items. The monsters have magic items. So magic items will end up flowing into the hands of the PCs. But we tried to kind of balance PCs having a lot of crazy stuff with GM having the option of flushing those out of the system over time. Is there any new races or classes that are different from like traditional D&D 5e that we would see in Tolis or, is, or are they very similar? Uh, you have your basic elves and dwarves and, and gnomes and halflings and humans, of course. Um, technically, you could play a dark elf in, in Tolis because um, they're in the player's handbook, but all the dark elves under Tallis, like they're they're an evil city. Uh, we do make a point to say not all dark elves are evil. There are settlements of dark elves outside of Tallis that are not under the sway of these evil gods. But the main settlements of Drow under what well, we don't say Drow, we say dark elves. Main settlements of dark elves underneath Tallis are a matriarchal uh, society ruled by this evil goddess, and so. Those people are evil. Like literally, dark elves are illegal in Talos. So it, we point out and say, if you want to play a dark elf PC, one, you're probably not from Talos. You're one of these, you know, non-evil uh, dark elves from somewhere else. And two, you probably walk around in disguise all the time because you do not want to show your face. Um, and we also talk about, hey, like some people don't want to deal with that sort of fantasy racist campaign, and so maybe you shouldn't you know, have that aspect of it. Um, but we also have the Lightorians, which are the lion people. Um, we have Carabim, which are a frail kind of elf that is winged and they can fly. Um, it was interesting making mechanics for that because in 3E it worked a particular way in that you, I think you started taking ability damage from flying too much because fly to first level is a big deal. It, it breaks a lot of stuff because you're like, oh, I'm just going to fly over that trap door in the floor, that sort of thing. And I think what we ended up doing is the Carabim elves, uh, their flight is based on uh, levels of endurance. So you start taking endurance levels as you fly but as you level up you get longer periods of time that you can do your flight and eventually it doesn't cost you any endurance at all so by the time the wizard casts the fly spell the caribbean is like yeah i could fly about as much as you so you're not breaking the world um but it's mainly was meant to be a D, &D setting with the volume turned up to 11 so all the standard uh dwarves and elves and that sort of thing are standard and we added a couple of other things like the light rings. Oh, you can play lizard men. Lizard men are also pretty common uh, in, in Tallis too. Wizards of the Coast has made a huge push to make things more inclusive. They're trying to do away with a lot of the racial racial hatreds and, and things like that that we had traditionally seen in D and D. Um, and I do. You did mention this is something Nolan and I have often said is, if you don't want that at your table, don't do it at your table. Uh, we, we've said that quite a bit. And and we are very much in support of trying to make things as inclusive as possible. Is there any concern of possible kickback with not taking the step that Wizards has taken by saying, 
drow or sorry dark elves are evil uh well we actually had a big discussion about that and we went back and forth on updating the language for about two weeks and uh it affects dark elves and it affects orcs uh, because in in the world that Talus is in uh, ghoul the half god actually uh did experiments on some tribes of orcs and created what in the original Talus were different tribes of orcs that were always evil and we said yeah you know what that's that's not cool and so we ended up changing how we handle that and so now those two tribes of orcs that were in the original Talos game they are entirely separate species they happen to look like orcs because they were made from orcs but they're basically like they have the minds of demons in in mortal body form and so you can have these evil creatures that are intelligent but they are like capital e evil like these are these are basically like demons these are horrible undead not undead but they're, they're horrible monsters like in the same way that undead are horrible monsters but you can have regular old orcs and we talk about those orcs and say yeah you know what they often clash with humans but they've also been known to ally with humans against greater threats and you can like we don't include stats for orc pcs in the game but we talk about half orcs and there are plenty of half orcs who are yes i am from the ordinom tribe and we are we're very proud and they think that i'm weird for hanging around in the city but i this is what i've chosen to do uh and we make a point of saying that Talos is the most cosmopolitan city in the entire campaign world like other cities don't have minotaurs and lizard men and half orcs walking around but in Talos, you're like yeah this is joe he's a half orc whatever well you need to already we, mention the ability to protect the city you know so it's not like they're there with a reason. Ten other people higher than you are watching them. Cut them some slack. Like nothing weird is going to happen because you're in the middle. And of the actually, downtown. not even not even that level of it. Like there are going to be some people, just like in the real world, who are suspicious of half orcs or, or whatever. But half orcs are people. They they can be citizens of the empire. Like there are several characters who are named NPCs that are half orcs, and they're just people. So we don't cram all that prejudice into the default. Um, we worked really hard on, on adjusting the language for the Dark Elves to say, look, you know, we're not saying that all Dark Elves are evil. We're just saying that the ones that are here, here are evil. And if you don't want to be an evil Dark Elf or you don't want to deal with that, I have a cat who's going to step on my keyboard. It's very needy. Um, yeah, we've, we worked really hard on inclusiveness and sensitivity in dealing with some older material that you know, in, in 20 years, people have become more aware of the difficulty and, and the, the casual racism and stuff. stuff. So we're, we're trying to do better. Cool. I was just curious. It, it, it wasn't even a question I had originally thought of. And as we were talking, it kind of hit me that, huh, I know Wizards has made a big push for that. So I was just kind of curious how you guys were handling that. Yeah. That's and actually, cool. it's, you, it's funny you mentioned that because I think just two weeks ago, uh, the new D&D book came out and it said, hey, by the way, you know, this is how races work now. You don't have these fixed stat bonuses and that sort of stuff. And I said, you know, MCG team, we are in the proofing stage for Talus. This is our opportunity to change that for, for our species. And so we went back and we updated all of the PC stats for the PCs in the, the PC facing chapter to say, if you are a Litorian, you get plus one to one stat and plus two to another stat. If you're a lizard person, you get this and that, but it's not fixed. And it's not uh, like all lizard men know how to use axes and that sort of stuff. Like we, we've we taken the steps that wizards say, hey, let's decouple species biology from culture and allow people to make these sort of choices for themselves. Oh, I totally forgot. We also have centaurs as PCs. Well, how could you forget that? I you know they're 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 minor you know, minor species. Not not a lot of people play centaurs because when you have a big horse butt, it's hard to go down in a dungeon. But if you have just kind of an urban campaign, you have people and and centaurs are funny. Their their species name for themselves is Aram, and they're very proud. Like yes, I am Aram. They and so they're very boisterous, and they're just they're fun characters to play. Um, so if you're like that sort of character, totally play. We have a couple at our table. We really do. <laughs> uh, Nolan, you had, uh, there was a question that you had about um, stories and shows and worlds. and Yeah, we uh, so we're 
I think our next interview is with the people who helped bring altered carbon to the world. Um, you're bringing uh, Tolis to a modern, you know, uh, tabletop game. Is there a story, show, world, movie that you're inspired by that you said, you know what, that's got to be next, or that's what I would like to see next, or I can't wait to play that game. Uh, and my example always is, is I was an EverQuest player. Uh, I love the legendary items. I love the worlds. I love that story. I I could live there every day if it was in a tabletop RPG setting. And I know it was, but getting people on board with a 20-year-old game is tough. But uh, So one series that I've always been a fan of is a series by Lawrence Watt Evans. And it's a fantasy series set in the world of Ethshar that he created. And um, Ethshar is a, it's a fantasy world. Uh, there are wizards and sorcerers. And, and there's, he, from what I understand, this was originally his campaign world. He just started writing about it and made fiction novels about it. Um, but the really cool thing is most of them are city-based stuff because it's a very well-established civilization. They've got these gigantic cities and stuff. And there are all these different kinds of magic and every one of them is unique. It's not like how D&D, &D, and this is not a knock on D&D, &D, but like wizards and sorcerers and warlocks Basically, 90% of their magic is the same because a fireball from a wizard, same as a fireball from a sorcerer. And that's just because the game doesn't have enough pages to say, this is what a wizard fireball looks like in its stats. This is what a sorcerer's fireball is stats. This is what a warlock's eldritch blah that is equivalent to a fireball, it's stats. Um, you just have to consolidate some of those things so that the, the book isn't a thousand pages long. But in Fshar, he has wizards who are one type of magic witches that are like telepathy and emotion magic and limited sort of other things demonologists thurgists um sorcerers which are people who use talisman uh there are warlocks who are like hyper fine telekinetics um and so they, each of these types of magic has its own specific things that it can do and those that it can't do and has different advantages and weaknesses and he explores different aspects of each of those in every single book. And it's a great setting. Uh, it, it's very tallest like in that, you know, it's a modern, like the city that it's taking place in is like 500 years old. It's fully established. It is like the heart of this empire. Um, there really aren't monsters. It's a humanocentric sort of thing. And it's mostly about interpersonal issues and stuff. But I would love to run a game set in Ethshar. On the last time I read the books, I took extensive notes on what each of these types of magicians can do. So if I said, you know, if I was going to do this at an RPG, this is how I would do that. Um, the author's still alive. He's only like, you know, 60 years old. So I kind of want to be like, hey, have you ever thought about doing an RPG based on your world that was originally an RPG world? <laughs> and I would love to do that. That's cool. But I also, like, I watch all sorts of stuff. So uh, my girlfriend and Expanse. And so... You know, that is and that is a really fun sci-fi setting. And there's an RPG from the folks at Green Ronin for The Expanse. Um, we are dabbling in watching The Tudors, which is very saucy and sexy, except for Henry VIII. Um, my girlfriend has just started watching Bridgerton, which is, you know, the sense and sensibility with a lot more salaciousness in it. And personally, I would love to do a campaign that's all about, like, dealing with aristocracy and, everyone, and all the women are wearing these like or they, the empire waist sort of things and they have all these flowing gowns and they'd be like oh but mr darcy i have to object for this reason here and that sort of thing like that sort of stuff would just be wonderful i would love to have a game where every single player is just the person who's all very talkative and just gets into that dialogue it's i mean i find inspiration in just about anything so and i'm very eclectic so hell i would we love the queen's gambit and there was a musical very popular in the 80s called Chess that I am a big fan of. Uh, most people haven't heard of it. I think it was bigger in Europe, but it was written by two of the guys from ABBA, oddly enough. Um, the main character in the original cast is played by Murray Head, who is the brother of Anthony Stewart Head, who is Giles from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And the one breakaway hit that most people don't realize is but One Night in Bangkok is actually from the musical Chess. Okay, okay, wow. So a campaign set that's focusing on like the politics of chess and during the Cold War. Um, my girlfriend and I just finished the show called The Americans, which is about 
a group of embedded Russian spies pretending to be American, an American family in the United States in Washington, D.C., like that sort of intrigue would be super, super fun. Shell, what are some projects that you're working on right now that you can tell us about outside of TOLUS? I literally just yesterday wrapped up a new Monero book called Vertices, which of sites in Monero uh, counter locations. Basically, it's a bunch of, uh, in D&D terms, it would be, here's a bunch of dungeons that have a kind of a common theme. And uh, the common theme is that they're connected to this thing called the data sphere, which is like the Numenera version of the internet, except like Tron, you can actually physically upload yourself into it and be a digital person for a while. So each of these sites is a physical place that your characters can explore physically, but it also has a connection to the data sphere. Um, I'm also working on our next genre book for the cipher system called Claim the Sky, which is all about superheroes. And as a big superhero nerd dating back to the 80s and having worked on um, the alternative rules for supers, my own homebrew variants of supers, um, playing the hell out of the original Marvel Heroes uh, RPG from the 1980s, me getting a chance to work on officially a superheroes game is awesome. And so I've been rewatching a couple of Marvel movies and just taking notes left and right. And uh, yeah, that's pretty hot. And then I think the next thing that I'll be working on once I claim this guy is the next Tallis adventure. So currently, Tullus is available for pre-order on MontyCookGames.com. Of course, you, those of you who've missed the Kickstarter, you're missing out because you're missing out on all the the Kickstarter or the uh, the stretch goals and everything that came along with it because it was wildly successful. I mean, it, it was it was huge. I know Noel and I both looked at the numbers of the Kickstarter and we're like, wow, this is going to be incredible. Um, Nolan and I are both in sales. We both uh, sell cars for a living. And and we always, of course, you have like just a couple seconds to get somebody hooked on a vehicle or, or whatever it is you're trying to sell. And one of the things that we love to do is we talk to people who are creators who are doing these things is give them a chance to give us what we call the one minute pitch, the elevator pitch. Why should people play Tolis? What, why, why should they buy it? Sean, convince us. I mean, we're already convinced, but convince us to buy this game. So Tallis is D and D taken to eleven. Like it has barbarians, it has warlocks in this city-based campaign. But everything that you'd expect to do in a typical fantasy campaign, which is dealing with nobles and dealing with merchants and dealing with barbarian invasions, or having monsters, or doing dungeon exploring, even having dragons and dark elves, all of that is in Tallis. It's a complete city-based campaign setting. Everything you need to run multiple campaigns is right there. It's got tons of new magic items, tons of new spells, lots of adventures and adventure hooks, cool stuff for PCs to do, cool stuff for PCs to be. Like I have played in two different Talos campaigns, never had any overlap in the content, and I read the book from scratch last year and still found new things that I had never seen before. There's so much in this book it's crazy. And it was written by the person who wrote the third edition Dungeon Master's Guide. So it was chock full of amazing advice for GMing. And we borrowed a lot from how travel works. So there's indexes and little notes information about this PC or this NPC, turn to this page. Or for more information on this guild, turn to this page. Everything is just filled to the note, the margin is filled up with notes on where you can get more background information on what you're reading about. It's an amazing book and I'm very proud to work on it and it's totally worth it. Nolan, do you have any more questions? I don't. Uh, you know, we always talk about the people coming on and the passion for it. And you know, a lot of times it's people just getting started. Uh, you are a seasoned adventurer and writer and still having that passion uh, makes me feel good to just be around the genre. I mean, it's, it's so cool. I love talking to people that get it and do it and love it and still do after all this time. So thank you for sharing that love and passion with everybody. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really digging Tallis. I appreciate your Tallis. I've been running my home game and I'm like half of what's in my home game is stuff that's fully written out in the book and half of it is just like little seeds that I'm kind of expanding upon, but they've gotten to the point now where they need to break into the Dark Well Aquarium where all the demons and the undead live because there is a, a vampire child that they want to rescue. And they're like, we're way in over our heads. And then they just found out that there's a vampire been hiding out in their basement. And they're like, well, do we wake this guy up? Do we just kill him? And it turns out he's a vampire who hunts other vampires. And they're like, oh, if we could recruit this guy to our cause, we might actually have a 
at getting this little girl out of the grasp of the vampires. And so, but they were just the entire time, they're like, wait, there's a vampire in our basement? Wait, he's not evil? Wait, what? They're just, and Tallis is always like, there's something underneath. You know, it's wonderful to see that in, in the eyes of the players. Well, I know we are excited and I know we can't wait. It's going to be probably a, uh, probably April, I think, is when we should see delivery somewhere around there. I think so. Yeah, I haven't checked the release dates. I mean, it's it's all in the other people's hands now, so I don't right. keep track of that. But I think it's April, maybe May. And, it's and on our site. And COVID has made everything a little bit more difficult to get things shipped out, and we understand that. We back a lot of Kickstarters and have waited a long time for stuff. So, um, and I do know that if you do pre-order the book, it says on the website that if you do pre-order Tolis, you do get it shipped to you a couple of weeks before the initial order goes out. So, if that's something you guys like, if you want to get in early, so to speak, and you miss the Kickstarter, you still have a chance to do the pre-order and get your books before everybody else. Sean, thank you so much for coming here today. Um, I am going to make sure we include all your contact information that I have, excluding your email, um, for, so people can get a hold of you, uh, especially you mentioned tweet me some ideas if you have them for new Tola stuff. Uh, so we will include that and anything else you want us to include in the show notes. There is a link to Monty Cook Games in the show notes for, so folks can go pre-order it. We cannot recommend this enough. We are so excited from what Nolan has seen in the Kickstarter and from what we have read. Um, this is just going to be amazing. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming on our show today. Thank you, guys. That's it, guys. Join us tomorrow as we are joined by Chris De La Rosa and Knox Weiler uh, as we talk about Altered Carbon and Gods of Ragnarok, or Gods of Metal Ragnarok. Thanks you, everybody, for joining us today. Bye. Bye.